final speaker of this year's Aging Research and Drug Discovery Meeting, uh, Linda Partridge. Linda, can you hear us? Hi. Hi, Linda. Whenever you're ready, you can share your screen. And we very much look forward to, to, your, uh, to your presentation. Good. Thank you very much. So I hope you can see my screen. Looks great. Uh, okay, one of the really nice things about talking last in a meeting like this is that so much of the background to the talks already been covered in the, some of the fantastic presentations that we've had during this terrific meeting. It's been so nice to see everyone again. It's really great seeing people in the same room. I wish I was there too. And I'd really like to thank Morton and Daniela and Alex for including me in the meeting. So in the lab, we're very much involved in this by now familiar picture of the underlying mechanisms of aging, it, the hallmarks which act and interact to produce the various phenotypes of aging, subclinical ones in humans to start with, like gain of abdominal fat, but eventually age-related disease, multimorbidity, frailty. And like others, we're interested in these, these many interventions that can have an effect on one or more of these hallmarks to ameliorate what happens. Um, so genetics, of course, is a very powerful experimental tool in the model organisms. As far as real life interventions go, diet and exercise so powerful in humans. But also, as we've heard a great deal in this meeting, a lot of interest in pharmacological interventions by drugs and metabolites. And we're particularly interested in this nutrient sensing part of the space, the insulin IGF tool signaling network, and the possibility of pharmacological inhibition of it to improve health during aging. We work um, particularly with flies and mice. This is just a cartoon, even so very oversimplified, of the fly nutrient sensing network and some of the drugs that we're interested in. So we've got the ligands, just one receptor in these uh, lower invertebrates, and then branching of the pathway below the receptor into this uh, RAS pathway, where we've shown that genetic inhibition can extend lifespan in flies, um, but also uh, so can this drug, uh, trametinib. It's a GSK uh, MEK kinase inhibitor, and it's used for the treatment of a particular type of malignant melanoma. Um, we've then got the branching down the canonical bit of the pathway to FOXO and other transcription factors. And here we've been particularly interested in lithium, which interacts with this bit of the pathway. Um, amongst other actions, it inhibits GSK3, which is called shaggy in the fly, and goes through this cap and collar transcription factor to extend fly lifespan. And it also extends lifespan in worms. And there are some indications from epidemiological studies that it might have beneficial effect in humans as well. And then, of course, as we've heard a lot about, there's this much more evolutionary, ancient, intracellular nutrient sensing part of it, the tall uh, complex, um, and especially mTOR1 in its inhibition by rapamycin is probably the geroprotective effect that's furthest along the road. Rapamycin can extend lifespan in all of the uh, model organisms. And we've heard from the beautiful work of Joan Manick about the translational um, possibilities for humans. And we're interested in how these drugs work and also taking them forward into mice. And as I've indicated, lithium looks quite promising because it seems to be geroprotective in both flies and worms. So we've been looking in mice, but rather disappointingly, don't see anything terribly positive. So this is a very thorough study by Tobias Nespital, who's a postdoc in the lab in Cologne. And he's been very careful to work at, at safe doses because uh, lithium can be very toxic in high doses, and particularly it's toxic to the kidney. So he's been uh, very careful about that, but otherwise very thorough looking at both the chloride and the carbonate, both sexes of mice and different mice strains. And you can just see some of his survival data here. And essentially, he either sees nothing in lifespan in either sex, or if he pushes it up in this middle pair here with 1.05 grams per kilograms in the mouse chow and starting late in life, you actually start to see a reduction in lifespan, particularly in females, but also a hint of it in males. 
So the first effect that we see on lifespan is a negative one. And so there doesn't seem to be a sweet spot, at least for lifespan. And if we look at uh, late life phenotypes, we see patchy and very modest effects. So I think lithium itself is not promising uh, for mice, although it's possible that more direct or more specific inhibition of GSK3 uh, might be, because as I say, lithium has a number of other effects in mammals um, as well as that. Trematinib, the uh, MEK inhibitor, is looking much more promising in mice, both in terms of lifespan and other phenotypes. I don't have time to talk about it this evening, but uh, I hope it's something I'll be able to talk about in the future. Um, what I do want to talk about for the rest of the time is rapamycin, our most developed protector, And there are two aspects of it that we're particularly interested in. So one of them is the timing of the effects. There's quite a lot of evidence from mice now that intermittent treatment rather than continuous treatment can be beneficial, although it's not clear whether it's as beneficial as continuous. But this suggests there may be something quite interesting with heritage effects of the drug. And we're also interested in cell types that might be targeted because the drug does have yin and yang effects. And if it were possible to target a molecule to those tissues where it has beneficial effects, perhaps by using different dr drugs, um, I think that would be a powerful thing to do. So the first point I'd like to make is this one, which is a rather striking observation by Paola Juricic, who was a student and postdoc in the lab in Cologne. She's now in Andrea Ablis's lab in Lausanne. And what she showed was that, as we already know, rapamycin increases ply lifespan. As Yushuan Lu said earlier in the meeting, only in females. It doesn't extend male lifespan at all. But what Paula found was that if she just treated the flies for the first couple of weeks of adulthood with the drug and then withdrew it, then waited for what's a very long time in the lifespan of a fly until they started dying, um, you can see that their lifespan is extended just as much as with chronic treatment with the drug. So the earlier effect is somehow remembered over this very long period. It's nothing to do with um, chronic inhibition of TOR signaling because, you know, for instance, phosphorylation of S6 kinase jumps right back at normal levels uh, when the drug is withdrawn. And it's also nothing to do with the microbiome. Um, rapamycin actually has very little effect on the microbiome. And in any case, if you remove the microbiome, rapamycin still extends the lifespan of the fly. So it's neither of those two. And again, as Yushuan mentioned in his talk earlier in the meeting, as well as this sex difference in the response of lifespan to rapamycin, there's a difference in what happens with gut pathology, partly because there's a very big sex difference in the way the gut ages in the first place. So I think you may have seen this before. Um, what we're seeing is flies getting older to the right and the structure of the columnar epithelium of the gut. And in males, essentially nothing happens. The structure stays the same and the gut doesn't get any leak here as they age. In females, it's very different. What we start to see is high rates of proliferation of the gut stem cells to give rise to these clusters of misdifferentiated cells, sometimes called tumors. Then we start to see wound healing rosettes. Um, it, the um, epithelium comes away from the basement membrane. And eventually, by the time a female is old, the structure is totally gone and her gut becomes leaky. And rapamycin actually rescues this gut pathology of the females to quite a considerable extent. It re uh, rescues all those phenotypes. And interestingly, again, just early treatment with the drug is enough to produce the restorative effect on the gut much later in life when it's measured long after the drug is withdrawn. Um, there's just an example of this here for the tumors, these misdifferentiated stem cells, and for the uh, leaky gut here, you can assay this with these blue flies with a dye that leaks out from the gut if it's, not, if it's compromised in its structure. And what you can see here is that chronic treatment with rapamycin, um, by the time the flies are at day 50, um, with the drug withdrawn at day 30, you see um, a reduction um, in this, this gut pathology. It's just as great in the ones that were treated earlier in, in which the drug's withdrawn. And again, chronic treatment reduces the um, formation of these blue flies and just as much in the flies that, from which haven't seen the drug um, for almost three weeks. So there's quite a big memory effect there. Again, from Yushuan, he mentioned in his talk that one of the actions of rapamycin in the gut of the fly is to increase autophagy in the enterocytes. 
So these are the large absorptive workaday cells of the gut. They're the main cell class in the gut. And rapamycin increases autophagy in them. And interestingly, the autophagy also shows a memory effect. So once the flies have been treated, it stays up. Um, as I'm sure you know, there are many different ways of measuring autophagy, including probably what's the gold standard autophagic flux. And we've done all of them. Um, this is just a nice one visually, lysa tracker. And what you can see in the gut, in the enterocytes, is that with chronic treatment, you see these puncti compared with the control. These are the lysa tracker stained acidic compartments. If we look um, at day 27 in flies that were treated for two weeks at the beginning of life, the lysa tracker staining is quantified here is up just as much as with the chronic treatment. So all these effects, the lifespan, the gut pathology, um, and the autophagy show a strong memory effect of earlier rapamycin treatment. And this effect is causal in the extension of the lifespan of the flies, this um, increase in autophagy. Sorry, was slightly antsy. Uh, thank you. So if we block the increase in autophagy using RNA interference against ATG5, so this is the same ATG5 as in mammals, and it's involved in the um, extension of the phagophore membrane at that stage um, in the autophagy process. And if you RNA it in flies, um, you can block um, induced um, autophagy as a result of any intervention. And what we've got here on the left is the chronic situation. So we can treat the flies with rapamycin or we can induce the autophagy against HG5, uh, the RNA against HG5, specifically in the enterocytes. This is an inducible system of gene expression. And what we see is that if we give the flies rapamycin, as we've seen, we reduce the formation of these um, blue flies. This is at day 65, so long, long after the drug has gone. If we just do RNAi um, against HG5 in the basal situation, it has no effect on the gut. But if we do it in conjunction with rapamycin treatment, what it does is to block this reduction in leakiness that is a result of the drug treatment. So that's telling us that the leakiness is a direct consequence of the autophagy. Here, we've got the situation where the flies were just treated for two weeks early in life. And what these data show is you get exactly the same result if you simply do RNAi against HG5 in those same two weeks where you treat with rapamycin, that's sufficient to actually stop all the long-term effects of the drug treatment. So autophagy has to be up when the drug is administered to get the memory effect. And by the same token, if we induce autophagy way upstream by overexpression of ATG1, which is the equivalent of Alcon in mammals, so right at the start, of the autophagy process. Um, we've now got these data for lifespan. Um, what we find is that if we do that, again, using this inducible system, specifically in the enterocytes of the fly, then we can increase their lifespan. Of course, we can also do that if we administer rapamycin. And if we do the two together, this is chronically, we see no further increase in lifespan, implying that they might be in the same pathway. And we get exactly the same with short-term treatment here. So if we simply induce autophagy directly, genetically, for two weeks at the beginning of life, and then remove the inducer, when the time comes, we see the increase in survival to an equivalent extent as rapamycin alone. And if we also give those flies rapamycin, we see no further increase. So this is suggesting that really that what's crucial here are the enterocytes in the gut and this increase in autophagy in them. And all of this goes for the, um, the other um, characteristics, the, the gut pathology and so on. So what we can also show is that if we induce autophagy early in life using this mechanism, then autophagy actually stays up permanently. It's like a permanent induction. And um, this is shown here um, actually using um, REF2P, which is the equivalent of mammalian P62 as the readout. But again, all the aut autophagy readouts go together. Um, but what we find is that both um, chronic rapamycin treatment and chronic induction or autophagy directly result in a decline in REF2P. And the two together reduce it no further. 
So this is, again, doing the induction early in life and looking 10 days later. So autophagy actually has a memory of itself. Once it's been induced in these cells, it stays up. And we're extremely interested in the mechanism by which that's happening. We're working very hard on it at the moment. Um, but I should say it's got nothing to do with the mechanism that Yushuan mentioned in his talk. So rapamycin has two, two quite separate ways of inducing autophagy in the gut. It can do it through this canonical pathway, HG1 and so on. Um, but there's also a non-canonical but acute induction further downstream. So what happens is that histone expression is increased by rapamycin and this transcription regulates um, autophagy effector genes. So rapamycin is acting in two completely different ways in this class of cells to induce autophagy, one acutely and the other with a long-term memory effect. And we're starting to see similar things in mice. We've done a rather similar experiment here uh, where we've either allowed the, the mice to, to get to three months and then um, not treated them at all, continuously treated them with rapamycin, or treated them with rapamycin for just three months, then removed the drug and allowed everybody to go through to a year old to look at whether there are any memory effects at 12 months of this earlier rapamycin treatment. And because of the information from the fly, of course, we've been very interested in the gut, and we particularly looked at these pinus cells in the crypts in the intestine of the mouse. Um, they act as the niche for the stem cells in the intestine. Um, they've got these rather easily quantified granules in them, which have, have very many biological activities and are crucial for pinus cell function. And we know that autophagy is important for pinus cell function as well. So this seemed like a good place to start. And indeed, we see some quite striking memory effects. So these are two age-related things that happen to the panis cell granules. So they're phenotypes that show up as mice age. And one of them is this one on the left, which is that the granules become hyperdense. So the granules are these black spots that you see here. And in a healthy young mice, they look like this rapamycin chronic treatment. You see nice uh, black uh, dots with just a very thin white ring around them. But as the mouse gets older, you see what's happened in this control at one year of age, which is these big white rings and a reduction in the size of the granules themselves. And rapamycin blocks that age-related increase at 12 months. This is with chronic treatment. If we look six months after the drug's been withdrawn, we see just as great an improvement in the appearance of the cell granules. This is another phenotype which basically tells the same story. It's an association of the granules, this time with lysosomes, rather ironically, and the uh, granules start to um, get destroyed and, and to disappear. So the density of the um, granules goes down in the cells. And again, we see the same story, a strong age-related effect and a memory effect of the rescue by rapamycin. We can also get this indirect um, indicator of gut leakage in the mouse. So this is the present of lipopolyside um, pack <laughs> lipopolysaccharide binding protein in the circulation of the mice. And that's down with chronic rapamycin treatment, but it's also down as much six months after the drug has gone. So we've also looked at uh, tight junctions. I don't want to drown you in data. And basically all of these phenotypes in the intestine and this indirect indicator of leakiness seem to have persisted six months after the rapamycin has gone. And of course, we're following um, another cohort of mice through to look at effects on lifespan. So the conclusions about the memory are that brief treatment with rapamycin early in adulthood or brief genetic induction of autophagy induce a long-term increase in autophagy itself, a decrease in pathology in the intestine and extend lifespan just as much as chronic treatment. If we treat mice from three to six months, that also induces a long-term reduction in intestinal pathology apparent for at least for six months. And I think the importance of the intestine in organismal aging is probably being quite underrated. And with that, I'll thank the model organisms, our funders, and you for your attention at this late hour in the day. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Linda. That was a fantastic talk. And thank you so much for finishing up this meeting. We have a few questions. There's one upvoted question on Slack, which is my own question, so that's good. 
Uh, does leaky gut influence nutrient uptake? Um, we've actually not made any direct measurements of nutrient uptake, and I think it would be very interesting to do so. Um, and yes, I would, I, I would be surprised if it didn't affect nutrient uptake, but we haven't directly measured it. So is there any overlap with um, like IGF-1 signaling or dietary restriction type of pathways? Um, well, if you do rapamycin and dietary restriction together in flies, um, the, to summarize a lot of results, it looks as though TOR inhibition or TOR1 inhibition accounts for some of the effects of dietary restriction, yes, but in flies, not all of them. Okay, all right, very good. There's one more question on Slack and potentially the last question of this conference. We have, we have a question from the audience. The conference is not over yet. We have another question in the audience. Yeah, I, I was just curious, this early life rapamycin treatment, are there any trade-offs or side effects, long-term side effects of this early treatment that is restricted just to a small window? At the moment, I can't answer the question. I mean, we know what some of the negative um, effects of rapamycin treatment are in mice, you know, on testicle, cataract, and so on. Um, so these are things that we can look at, but for the moment we've been really concentrated on the gut because of the information from the fly. But there's still a lot of work to do on the material from those mice. Great, and maybe the last question of this year's Aging Research Drug Discovery meeting, uh, or the second last maybe. Do you suspect that this prolonged autophagy effect can also be initiated through other means, such as fasting or caloric restriction? Um, it would be very interesting to look at the um, fasting. I mean, that would be the most obvious inducer of autophagy, and it would be very interesting to know if one of the effects of intermittent fasting is to produce this um, memory effect, which then persists after the fasting stops. It would be very nice to know if that's a player. Yeah. I, I completely agree with that. And the last question is, would you consider coming back to ARDD next year? <laughs> Yes, of course. I hope in person next time. That I would wish be I could fantastic. Join you. I wish I could join you all for a drink now. Yes, we will soon have drinks. So thank you so much, Linda, for joining. Fantastic talk. <laughs>